All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, hope you're all doing well. Um, so, you know, I've been getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of questions on uh, updates with COVID, um, especially regarding the, um, the vaccine. What should we do? Um, so the, I can't, on, on my computer screen, I cannot see the chat box rolling, right? But Cynthia has her screen up. And so anything that she sees, she's gonna relay the questions to me. Um, there's a lot of slides to kind of get through. Um, so I will answer the questions. Uh, if I feel a question um, is not relevant to the slide that I'm on, I may hold off because I may answer that question in the next two or three slides. If it's relevant, I'll answer the question at that point. But I certainly will be answering all the questions at the end of the, uh, of this presentation, okay? Hmm? It's in my jacket, my coat pocket. All right, so um, January 28th, and again, can everybody believe that it is almost a year? It's almost a year, right? A year ago, New York City did not look like this, right? How about our world is turned upside down? Um, so first, I want to just before I get rolling here is a couple of things. Um, first, again, I've been getting a lot of phone calls and I'm, um, I'm honored and even privileged that you're reaching out to me for advice or information. I, I just want to make sure that you understand that my goal tonight is to provide you with information. All right now, I've certainly have done my homework and I've studied every lots of things that are out there. Uh, I've gone deep into research. Um, so what I'm trying to present is not a matter of opinion this evening. I'm trying to stick to science, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move through this. Uh, the beginning part of this is gonna be just kind of a, uh, an overview of the virus, an overview of the immune system and then we're gonna go a little bit deeper into the nuances of the vaccination. And then we're gonna kind of follow up on some strategies. Now I will tell you, you know, you've all been listening to news and different things. I'm sure you're hearing all kinds of stuff, but I'm gonna tell you that there is gonna be some things that I'm gonna tell you this evening that you're gonna hear this evening that you have not heard before because I haven't heard it yet <laughs> on the news. So, um, Stick around for that. It's pretty important. Okay. All right. Let's grow with this. So, again, really, we're facing uh, the question, right? Whether to vaccinate or not vaccinate. That is the question. <laughs> All right. So, these are some of the questions that I've been getting. Certainly, questions that we are hearing on the news. Uh, and if, as we roll along here, if you have other questions, certainly post them. Okay, let me just see if I have to admit anybody here. All right, so the question is again, you know, is it safe? Is it going to give me the virus if I get the vaccination? What's actually in it? Can it change my DNA? How will it affect my autoimmune disease? What's the difference between the Pfizer vaccination and the Moderna vaccination? If somebody says, if the survival rate is 99%, then why should I bother getting it? And what about natural herd immunity? Is that the better way to go? And then of course, what do we do now about a variant? So I think these are pretty uh, ample topics to, to discuss. Uh, let me get to this. All righty. So let's just start with some basics, okay? Um, I lost the thing. So this, you've all seen pictures of this, right? I hope you like my slides. I made them all today for you. Um, but again, this is what a, the coronavirus looks like. You've all seen images of this, right? But these little red things sticking out here, right? These are called the spike proteins, right? The virus is this, it's this globular thing in here. But this red stuff on the outside of the surface is the spike protein. This is the virus's weapon. 
this is what the virus uses to lock onto your cells to get into your cells. Right. So this is where the emphasis is being put. This is where the vaccinations intention is, is here, is that the protein, uh, spike protein, okay? So let's have a little bit of a, re a review of the immune system, immune system 101. Now I'm doing this because this is important, okay? Even if you guys have heard this, um, some of you have, some of you haven't, it's, it's certainly well worth a review. Um, it's important to know these things, it is very relevant. It's relevant, not just to the vaccination, it's relevant to just overall immunity and, and what you could be doing and should be doing to protect yourselves, uh, whether you get a vaccination, you don't get a vaccination, but it, it does play a big role also in understanding how the vaccination itself works. And that's why we need to be discussing this. So this is important, okay? So fundamentally, your immune system has two specific responses. So you have what is called the innate response, and you have an adaptive response. Your innate response is your immediate response. It is your inborn, you, you're born into the world with an innate immune system. Your innate immune system, if you get infected, if you get, if a, a germ comes in, not just even a coronavirus, if any germ comes in to your environment, the innate response is the first one on the scene. So there's a lot of different types of innate cells macrophages and dendritic cells. We're not gonna to get too deep into this, right? But they're the first ones on the scene, right? And then you have your adaptive response. Your adaptive response comes on later. It's not your immediate response. And so in immediate response, the macrophages come in, kind of grab onto a, a, a germ. They try to digest it, but they're gonna send a signal to the adaptive system and tell them to come in for help, okay? So the adaptive response is gonna come in later in the infective stage. The adaptive response is broken down fundamentally into two types of subsets, which are T cells and B cells. Right? It's also known as Th1 and Th2, right? It's the B cells, the Th2 side, the B cells that are making antibodies. Now you've all heard about antibodies, right? Right. What I need for you guys to do is either put your thumbs up or say yes on the chat. So to let me know that what I'm saying is, is resonating with you. Otherwise I'll re-explain things. So I need you guys to do, shake your head, put a thumbs up, get up and do a dance, do something. All right, so your adaptive response, again, T cells and B cells, your B cells are making antibodies, okay? The antibodies are made in your lymph nodes. You know, like when you feel your lymph nodes kind of swelling around your throat and under your armpits and stuff, right? That is your immune system activating, right? And it's in those lymph nodes that the B cells are activated and then they're gonna make antibodies. Now what antibodies do, right? You'll see in the next few slides is that they're gonna lock onto certain proteins, right? And when they do that, it gives instruction to the T cells to go do something. So the T cells are adaptive, but they're also like killer cells. So they also, they have names like natural killer cells and cytotoxic cells. So this is the immediate response. This is the adaptive response, okay? When they're turned on, the B cells need to make antibodies. Like when, when we, we've all gotten sick somewhere in our lives, right? And your kids get sick, and you feel lousy, right? You have no energy. You don't want to get out of bed, blah, right? That's because your lymph nodes, your B cells in your lymph nodes are activated. And what they're doing is you're using energy to make antibodies, right? When you get enough of these going on, then the T cells see the proteins that are tagged with an antibody and they kick into gear and they start trying to take care of, take care of business, okay? So let's go back and now, since we want to talk about antibodies, which are so important, right? Because the very essence of the vaccination is to activate antibodies. So what the heck are antibodies? So we know the B cells are making antibodies, right? So this picture, they kind of show these shape because most of the antibodies are shaped like a Y. 
Right? They're not perfectly structured like this, but this is kind of what they look like. They're Y-shaped. So that's the symbol for an antibody. Right? And we have different types of antibodies. You have different responsibilities. Right? So the main ones we're talking about are IgAs, IgMs, and IgGs. Right? Just again, for everybody to get caught up to speed here, right? is that the IG stands for, I stands for immuno or immune system, and the G is a globulin, which is a protein. So these are immune proteins and they are, so antibodies are immune proteins and they are just delegated into different groups, IgAs, IgGs, Ig, IgMs and IgGs, and I didn't put up here IgEs. IgEs are not relevant for this topic, but an IgE is your allergy response. So if you have an IgE antibody response to cat dander or to birch trees or to peanuts, you know, you're going to flare up immediately, right? But that's not what is important for this subject matter, okay? The IgAs and the IgMs are the early onset antibody response. If anybody watched the videos, the, the webinar I did going way back in the beginning of this, I did a few of those where I showed you the charts, but what happens in the early onset of, an of, of this infection specifically, but most, but especially in this infection, right, is there's a delay of the immune response where a person can be infected, right, but not, be, not have any symptoms. When they start developing symptoms, is the early phase, and that's when the IgA and the IgM antibodies are starting to go up, right? So if you test IgA and IgM antibodies, if they were positive, that means that you would be in the early phase of the infection. Around day 14, right? Well, around day 10, they're starting to decline, and by day 14, they should be kind of declining altogether. But it's around day 14 that the IgG antibodies are taking off. So the IgG antibody is, the, is coming at the back end of the infection, right? And the, and the idea of the IgG is to hopefully give us long-term immunity so that you have that. What they do is they provide a memory of the infection. And that does happen in a lot of other types of infections, right? So if you've had the measles or the measles vaccination, you know, you have IgG antibodies that are lasting for decades. So really the goal is in this coronavirus is the hope is in some way, shape or form that if we get infected, we can get sufficient IgGs and they can last a long time. If they last a long time, then we would have a memory and an ongoing immunity. That's the goal. Whether we achieve that from actually being infected and getting these antibodies that will last a long time, or if we get a vaccination to try to create those. But the concept is, and this is important, the concept is to develop these long-term memories. That's what's gonna give us the long-term immunity. Let me go to the back, I wanna show you this back, to, I just thought about something. This is relevant because this is what makes this particular virus unique in the sense that when you get infected with a germ, right? We said that the innate response kicks in. And then once it's taking care of business, what's going on? Okay, there. Oh, oh. I didn't see that. All right. All right. So, okay, so there's a few people that just jumped on board here. So again, the immune system 101, the innate response is your immediate response. The adaptive response is the secondary comes in later. But what's unique to this virus is that the innate response does not unfortunately respond right away. This virus has the ability to evade these innate response immune cells. Not only does it evade it or avoid it, and very often it's actually killing these macrophages, it's destroying the macrophages. So what does that mean to all of us? It means that there is a very strong delayed innate response so this adaptive response is taking longer to kick in. So what does that mean? It means that the virus has a huge advantage, right? It's been given a huge head start to lock onto your cells, 
with those spike proteins and get inside that cell and start replicating. So it is replicating thousands of folds and infecting other cells before this thing could even catch up. It's like trying to run across a football field. You start on one end on your racing somebody and you give the other person a, a head start at the 40 yard line and you're trying to race them across the, you know, to the next goal line. So you're at a huge disadvantage, right? So we need to find ways to get better advantage over this virus, okay? And that's what we'll get into. So here's a pretty cool picture, right? Yeah, Cynthia just you know, reminded me, for anyone who just kind of got on a little bit late, you only missed like one or two slides, no big deal. Um, but I will be hanging around answering all these questions. So just, we haven't even gotten to the juicy part yet. So you haven't missed a whole lot, so no worries. Um, but we're talking about the antibodies, which are why I show these blue colorful things are your antibodies. So here's the virus bouncing around and here's those spike proteins that we're talking about and what these antibodies are doing, right? is they are binding onto the spike proteins. That's what you hope for. And that's what an antibody does. An antibody is like a bullseye, okay? Right, go back. The antibody is like a bullseye, right? It's the B cells are antibodies. And they're then these T cells, these killer cells see the antibodies, okay? So, right, once we have enough of these antibodies, locking onto spike proteins, the T cells can then say, okay, let's go. And you create a cytotoxic effects to start to destroy the virus. Okay, everybody cool with that? Yeah, all right. If you're not, just say so. All right, so let's more get into the vaccine part of this whole thing, right? I think it's just important that you guys understand the mechanisms of how the basics of the immune system works, why you have an innate response, and why you have an adaptive response, right? And the adaptive response fundamentally is what creates the antibodies, and that's what hopefully gives us a long-term immunity, right? And we either have to develop that ourselves, or we have to get it from a different source or combinations of different things, right? So I'm often asked, you know, what's different about the old vaccines, the regular vaccines that we get, you know, regular flu vaccines and whatever vaccines we're getting versus the so-called new vaccine called the messenger RNA vaccine. Okay, right. and I say so-called new mRNA vaccine because it actually isn't that new, right? The, 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 the technology of using messenger RNA has actually been around for over a decade. Right. The only thing that's a little bit newer is how they deliver it. That was always the difficulty, all right? We'll get into this a little bit. And just, if you're not following me, ask questions, okay? All right. So in a typical vaccine, right, you're putting, you're putting an inactivated germ inside the body to mimic the infection. So in essence, they would be taking the virus, right? or parts of that virus in a vaccination with other stuff, injecting it into you to try to get the actual virus or an inactive version of it into your body so that your immune system, the, the B cells see the entire virus there and then they create an antibody against the virus. So what is different about the messenger RNA vaccine, it is a unique approach, right? Because what it's doing, it's instructing your cells to assemble spike proteins. All right, let me just make sure you follow me on this, All right? In typical vaccines, they're putting in a, either an inactivated germ or a convalescent germ, some version of it, but they're putting the whole germ in there, right? So that your immune system, your antibodies created against the actual germ. In the messenger RNA vaccine, they're not putting the virus in you. They're not putting the virus in the vaccine, which means they're not putting the, the virus in you, okay? What the vaccine carries is a messenger RNA. I'm looking at a screen. Okay, so that's, that is a distinct difference between these, these things, okay? Can I move my screen a little bit here? Just a few other people. Okay. Right. So, 
We'll move on to some slides here, get back and forth, right? So the messenger RNA is what makes this different. It's not putting the virus in you. It's putting information there, which is called the messenger RNA. So let's go. What exactly is RNA or a messenger RNA, right? Basically, it's like putting the, getting the instructions from Ikea to put the, the, the furniture together. If you don't have the instructions, you're sitting there with all these pieces. You don't know how to, how to assemble it, right? So messenger RNA is virtually, it's just instruction material telling yourselves to make proteins. One sense in your cell, after it gives the instruction, it is destroyed very quickly by enzymes. It does not hang around. It's not hanging around, okay? Um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but it does not hang around. It gets destroyed by enzymes and it does not migrate or move into the nucleus it does not do that. It is incapable of doing that. So it is in no way, shape, or form going to screw up your DNA. It has no influence on that. Okay, it's just instructional material. It's like thin paper and gets destroyed by enzymes. That's what a messenger RNA is. Okay, so if we take a cell of your body, okay, I'm going to give you the injection. You're injecting it into your shoulder, right? You're injecting it into your muscle. Right? You're not, you're not opening your arm and they're not putting it directly into your vein. So it's not going directly into your circulation. It's going into your muscle. That's the first response. Okay. So the messenger RNA. Now, what is different about this? Where the difficulties were in the past was how do we get, the, how do we get this messenger RNA inside the cell? Inside the cell. Remember, the messenger RNA inside your cell is just giving instructions. It's giving instructions so that the cell itself can manufacture the spike proteins, right? And then once the spike proteins are manufactured, when enough of them are manufactured, they will start to present on the surface of the wall. And then your antibody, your B cells are gonna see those spike proteins. And then you're gonna start manufacturing more of these antibodies that will stick to the protein. So it signals your B cells to make antibodies specific to the spike protein without giving you the virus. Pretty cool, right? The problem in the past is that to get the messenger RNA into the cell has been difficult. What they've been able to achieve very recently is known as nanoparticle delivery. Now, many of you who are patients in my office know that there's a lot of uh, vitamins or supplements that we use that are in what is called a liposomal delivery, right? You know, the glutathione that we use, you put it in your mouth, right? You squirt it in your mouth. It is it, the, 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 the antioxidant called glutathione is encased or carried by a fat molecule called the liposome. And what it does, in that case, you put it in your mouth, it goes into circulation, moves around, and when it comes in contact with your cell, the liposome blends into the cell wall because the cell wall of your cells is, a, is fat. So it's kind of a novel idea, right? If we can take something and stick it in the fat that is the same material of your cells, then the fat is going to blend into your cell walls and it's going to move right inside your cell. So whatever it carries, it carries it inside here. So just like we use liposomal delivery for vitamin D or glutathione, which makes the ability to get the glutathione right inside your cell, pretty good, right? Years ago, when you didn't have liposomal delivery, it was very hard to get the glutathione inside your cell. Right? But now we can do that. And so the same technology is being used for the messenger RNA. A liposome is a nanoparticle delivery. This is the frontier in science. So what they're doing, I don't want to beat this up, I want to make sure you know this, is that the messenger RNA is carried like basically in a fat molecule and it is carried inside of your cell. So the question people ask is, well, what's actually in the vaccine besides this so-called nanoparticle and the MR messenger RNA? Pretty much nothing. What's in there is the nanoparticle carrying the messenger RNA and basically saline, that's it. 
So we're not talking about mercury and heavy metals and all these other toxic things that we're so concerned about, right? We have saline and fat molecules that carries the messenger RNA. That's all that's in it. And it gets delivered inside your cell, okay? And then it gives instructions to make these spike proteins. As I said before, can it change my DNA? The answer is no. The messenger RNA gives instructions and then enzymes, these enzymes psh, destroy it. It never goes inside your DNA. DNA is untouched, no change to DNA. What's the difference between the Pfizer vaccination and the Moderna vaccination? They are pretty much the same, except that the, the fat molecules that they're using are slightly different. So in the Pfizer case, the fat molecules need to be stored at a lower temperature uh, than the Moderna, right? You got to have really, really low temperatures to keep the fat molecules stable enough so that it can get into the cell. Moderna is using a different combination of fat molecules that have stability at a little bit of a higher temperature, which makes the Moderna a little bit easier for distribution. But other than that, they're pretty much the same. Okay on that? If I can, okay, there's a question coming in. Some, what's that? So the delivery mechanism, okay? So in the vaccine, let's make sure you guys are correct. In the vaccine, right? We're concerned always about vaccines, whatever vaccine we're getting exposed to, including flu vaccines and other shingles vaccines and stuff. And it's like, what the heck is really in there, right? Um, and I think we should be concerned about what's in there, right? I'm always amazed about how many people just walk down to Walgreens every year and stick out their mom and get a needle put in there for their yearly shots. I mean, like, what's in there, right? But the old vaccines do have a co combination of concoctions in there that can create a lot of problems. This vaccine is different. Again, this that vaccine, what's in it is strictly the messenger RNA information, and it's carried by a nanoparticle, which is basically a fat molecule. Okay, so the RNA is carried by fat. Is that okay? Pretend, all right, look, pretend this, this cell, this is a, an actual cell of your body. It shows a nucleus and mitochondria and different things. So just pretend you don't see all this material inside. Just pretend that the, what you see here, this red thing is the messenger RNA. And this whole thing here is just fat with some saline solution in it. That's what's in, that, that's what it is. Okay, so they came on a little bit late. Okay, so somebody's asking, that, what's, I'm sorry, but we'll go back on a slide. It's okay, a few people got in a little bit late. So what's the difference between the messenger RNA and DNA? Oh, I didn't answer that question. DNA is what resides inside your nucleus. DNA is what carries your genes, right? So your DNA, your genes, are then expressing, they need information, and then your genes express what type of protein they're gonna make. So your DNA carrying the genes is what makes protein. Should I make, um, should I make a liver cell? Should I make a red blood cell? Should I make a white blood cell? Should I make uh, an immune cell? What should I make? In this case, the instruction from the messenger RNA is telling the DNA to make a protein, which is a spike protein, which is what the virus carries to get inside your cell. So as the DNA then gets the instruction and it's making the spike proteins, when you get enough of those spike proteins, the cell is gonna start sticking out these spike proteins. It's gonna present the spike proteins. And that is what you want your immune system to see because it's new to the immune system. So your, anti, your B cells are gonna create an antibody against these newly formed spike proteins. And they're doing that without giving you the virus. That's pretty cool, okay? You good so far, Synth? All right, we'll get to that with the actual vaccine in a second. Is everybody okay so far with this point? Just if you're not, just say something. 
And okay, we'll go back and forth as much as you guys want. So this is what the research is saying. I told you from the start, some people came on late. My goal this evening is to, to try to provide you with clinically relevant information that is based in science and based in research and not just hypothetical opinions or even my opinions. And the decisions that I'm making for myself and for my family is based on research, okay? And what I know to be true, All right? So what the research is saying, in case, you can read this, in cases of severe COVID-19 infection, long-term antibody immunity is shown to be absent. That's not good. That's not what we hoped for, right? What we hoped for, and we didn't know in the beginning because it was new, right? But now time is marching on. And what you're seeing is that when people are infected with this disease, especially when they're getting severe COVID, you would hope that they now have antibodies that are lasting a long time, built up the immunity, but it's not happening. It's not happening. You have to remember this point because it'll be, you'll see in the next slide here, right? So in cases of severe COVID, the long-term antibody immunity is absent. So we have to take that into consideration with our decisions. COVID-19 disease can cause the development of new autoimmunity. Right? This is a nasty virus. Right? What you see with people, right, is what's happening with people who get the virus and, and not, not even people that have severe cases. We're not even talking about the severity where people actually die from this thing. What we're talking about, you know, we, the, the, the term, they're calling them long haulers, which refers to people that get the infection and get over the infection, but now their world is turned upside down because now they have a myriad of chronic weird symptoms that are persisting for, for many, 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 many months now. And what the science is showing us is that really the precipice that what's happening is what this disease is doing, what this virus is doing, it is upregulating and it is turning on autoimmunity. So when you hear about people getting COVID-19 disease and then they're having, you know, uh, <laughs> strokes, they're having uh, more advanced cardiovascular stuff going on. Okay. What it's all pointing to this is why they're getting like multiple multiple organs affected because they are getting progressive autoimmunity. So this thing is turning on autoimmunity. Okay. So you got a situation where the, if you get the virus that you're faced with, you know, not really getting long-term immunity to it. So that means that you are susceptible to getting infected again. If you got the virus and you got over it in March, doesn't mean you can't get it tomorrow. You can get it again. And it could be more aggressive, more serious, depending upon the state of your immune system. Okay. The messenger RNA, this is research, the messenger RNA may protect against both effects. The messenger RNA vaccine may protect both against limited immunity and give us longer immunity, and it may help to protect against developing autoimmunity. We will get to the mutations, okay? Somebody's asking about the mutations. All right, just make sure, okay, because, all right, take a deep breath here, everybody. We'll get to the mutations, right? It's important. So Cynthia's saying she's getting a lot of questions. People are freaked out about a lot of things are hearing. And that's exactly why I'm doing this tonight. I'm doing this tonight to present to you. To, you don't have to get freaked out at all. You just have to be informed, right? And I will be here to answer all of your questions, okay? And nothing to get freaked out. That, the point is, is power is inf information, right? When you're getting scattered information and information for who knows what sources you're getting it from, conflictive information, that's what leaves people uh, paralyzed. Paralysis from analysis type of thing. I'm here to shed some light, to give you some comfort and clarity, 
right? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just trying to give you information. Okay, take a breath. <laughs> so pay attention to the next slide, everyone. <laughs> That's a picture of me when I was six. <laughs> All righty, so pay attention, okay? Um, this slide, this, this part of this presentation is information I can tell you that you have not heard anywhere. Now, I know maybe this is a little bit over some people's heads. I'm going to try to simplify this, but it's important. It's important that you hear this because really it's, it's really the, the bread and butter of what we're talking about really when it comes to decisions about the vaccination and we'll get into mutations and all that kind of stuff, okay? But we said earlier, and for some of you that came on just a little bit late, right? We said that you have two sides to your immune system, right? You have your innate response, which is your immediate response, right? And then when the immediate response comes in, it then tells the adaptive response to help out, right? And your antibodies are produced by B cells, which is part of that adaptive response. Okay, right? Your B cells are antibodies that are being made in lymph nodes. This is a picture. Let's just say this is a lymph node. The antibodies, okay, these B cells are making antibodies inside the lymph node in, in here, which is called a germinal center or germinal, yeah, germinal center. These are germinal cells, okay? This is where the B cells are supposed to be made. Okay, so what's happening with the infection when people get infected with COVID, right? In some cases, we know that say at some point they start making these antibodies. In some point they start making these IgG antibodies, right? But the problem, what they're finding is that the antibodies, these B cells are making them outside the germinal cell. They're making them out here. They're not making them here where they're supposed to. They're making the antibodies here. And when they make them outside the cell, right? These antibodies are less effective for long-term immunity against the virus, right? This is, that's what makes this virus like so unique. It's crazy, right? It's got this, this tactile way of, of, you know, avoiding our immune system, not making our immune system very effective, right? And giving it a chance to just keep spreading and making a foothold, right? When you're making antibodies, these B cells are making antibodies outside the germ cell, it's associated with a greater risk of developing multiple autoimmunity post-recovery. That's what I just said. So if you get the infection, there's higher risk of developing multiple autoimmunity. That's not so good for so many people that already have autoimmunity, right? If you already have an autoimmune condition, whatever it is, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's hypothyroid, so on and so forth, so on and so forth, right? Is, is the COVID has the way, because of the way the antibodies are produced, that it's gonna give you greater risk of developing multiple autoimmunity and short-lived memory, right? Again, we want B cells to produce inside the germinal center. So what has been shown, what the research, the science is telling us right now, the studies are telling us that the messenger RNA delivered through the vaccination, through this vaccine, is creating an appropriate germinal cell activation. The vaccine is getting your antibodies to be produced inside the germinal center. That is giving you an appropriate immune response. It is reducing the risk of developing autoimmunity or advancing autoimmunity. And it has been shown to develop long-lived antibodies. I'm not trying to sell anybody in the vaccine, but if you just look at this, I know what my decision is going to be. This is a key point. This, this, the evidence of this, of this research, of, this, of these studies, this is strongly suggests that, the, that herd immunity is much more likely to be accomplished through the messenger RNA vaccination than through popular illness. Let me repeat this to you. There's a lot of people that say out there, 
da, 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 about the vaccination. Let's let everybody get sick and we'll have herd immunity. The problem with herd immunity, right, is that you're not going to get long term antibodies, which means that the virus is going to come back, right? You have higher rates of autoimmunity. You're certainly going to have higher rates of deaths. But if you put the deaths aside, you're going to have an explosion of autoimmunity with, 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 with less long term immunity. All right, Cynthia's asked me a question. What's, what are you asking, Sam? So there's various questions of like, mm -hmm. you know about the Yeah, so I was saying, right, like yeah, what I was saying earlier, I don't wanna go back to the slide. Someone's asking about the differences in the, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccination, and the Johnson and Johnson one. No, no, I need, the, I need clarity on the question. No. Okay. Um, so just everybody's on board here. So again, I can't, Cynthia's given me the question. So she's saying there's a lot of questions about the, the differences and why, what Pfizer does what they do, what Moderna does what they do, and what, why Johnson Johnson is doing maybe what they're doing. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go back to the slide. I'm just going to explain it to you. All right. The, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine is different from the proposed Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine is this unique approach where they are using messenger RNA encased in fat with nothing there but saline solution. And the role of that is to get that into your cells so that the messenger RNA can give instructions so your DNA can stop making the spike protein. So you can start producing antibodies, which is what you want against the spike protein, which is the weapon the virus uses without giving you the virus. The difference between the Pfizer and the Moderna is just strictly the different fat soluble molecule that they're using, which just varies a little bit. The Pfizer, because of whatever fat they're using, it requires storage at lower temperature which makes distributing it a little bit more difficult. The Moderna vaccination, the fat cycle that they're using, right, is, is a little bit more stable at a higher temperature, which makes the ease of distribution better. But both of those fundamentally are delivering the same stylistic of, of vaccination. Johnson Johnson, from what I'm seeing and reading, is not. They're going back to sort of that old school, um, and, and they're actually like, you know, doing the, from what I understand, right, this is what I understand. They're actually going back to the old school of giving you the virus. Okay, so that makes that approach completely different than this approach. Okay. I'm talking in my emphasis today is I'm talking about the RNA vaccine. All right. Was that helpful? Okay. So we'll get into something. We'll get into some of these with these uh, allergic reactions and all that kind of stuff a little bit later. I think if I answer everything, we won't get through the slides too much, but um, we'll talk about those. We're going to talk about risk factors and stuff, right? And who maybe should not consider getting the vaccine and all that kind of stuff, right? But yeah, well, okay, yeah. The risk of introducing in a controlled way a single restricted part of the virus, the messenger RNA. Cynthia, can you help? I just, I, this is what happens. Where does she go? Okay. Just, I'll just... Yeah, I mean, the, the risk of, uh, look, the risk of introducing in a control way, a single restricted part of the virus, which is the messenger RNA, is much lower than the risk of a person contracting the actual virus. What's the risk? That's what you really are weighing out, right? I mean, you're concerned about a vaccine, as I am. 
right? You want information. You're like, if I'm going to go down there, you know, get a vaccine, what's the risk? Am I going to get, what's going to happen to me? Is am I going to screw up my DNA? Are they going to put a chip in there? Am I going to be a cyborg? And uh, am I going to get some kind of weird reactions and stuff like that? Versus if I just get the infection and write it out. I've heard people say to me, well, you know, I see a bunch of people getting the infection. And they just get over it. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you haven't been around enough people that have been dying and, 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 are, and are getting infected and now having all these, you know, horrible things going on. This is a very serious virus. Let's not put our, stick our head in the sand on this. That's foolish, right? This is, you know, risk. What's the risk, right? For, for the majority of healthy people, let's call it that, right? The risk of introducing this through a, this, the virus, it, it, the vaccine is much lower than the risk of actually contracting the virus for the reasons I showed you in the previous slide. If you want me to go back to the previous slide and show you, I will. Okay, let's just give, let's just get to give you this, some understanding here, right? So, I'm putting these slides up. I think the, the order in which I'm saying to you is helpful, but then certainly any questions, throw them at me, right? So, when you hear about the immune system response, many of you who are in my office hear this all the time, right? It's like really, you hear the term inflammation. I'm going to get inflammation. Things cause inflammation. Here you see this. Woman's knee is all red because it's inflamed. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is an immune response. That's what it is. Your immune system, activating your immune system, all right, response is inflammatory. And sometimes that's appropriate, right? If she injured her knee and it swells up, that's appropriate, right? But you wouldn't want this knee to be red hot and swollen for, you know, six months, two years, five years, you would say there's a problem, right? So if it's chronic, if it's unresolved inflammation, that's bad, right? If you got a bee sting, it would swallow, get hot, that's an immune system response. And then, you know, you calm down after a couple of days. So, you know, activating your immune system is not bad, right? So what we don't want is we don't want chronic inflammation. That's what we don't want. I'll leave the slide up for a little bit, right? So chronic inf chronic inflammation, not acute inflammation. Chronic inflammation, right, is the driver of autoimmune disease. All of them, rheumatoid, lupus, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, you name it, type 1 diabetes. Ca chronic inflammation is at the root of all cardiovascular disease. If you talk to a cardiologist knows what they're talking about, I said, hey, hey, doc, what's, you know, what's cardiovascular disease? Right? They're going to tell you it's inflammation. The result of cardiovascular disease is heart attacks and strokes, right? But it's driven by chronic inflammation. Or right? well, neurological diseases, brain degeneration, chronic inflammation, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all these degenerative things driven by chronic inflammation, arthritis is cancer. <laughs> I mean, they don't, cancer is a chronic inflammatory response, right? Pulmonary disease, everything is chronic inflammation. I'm just putting this over here on the side because there's more than just viruses. There's environmental things up. There's so many things that, that is the precursor that actually drives chronic inflammation. The, the, very, the very basics of everything that I do as a functional practitioner is to get to the root cause of what of chronic inflammation, right? I'm just showing you here, but you know, we're talking about this. So this virus, which is aggressive, which has the ability to evade, evade the innate immune system response, even kill parts of the immune system response, those macrophages, giving it a head start on the immune system, right? And then as I showed you in the previous slides, it actually gets your immune system to kind of make those antibodies in an incorrect way, in the wrong place, right? So you, it doesn't give you long-term immunity, right? And we know that this virus is really driving these, this aggressively this chronic inflammation that's springboarding autoimmune diseases. That's why you're seeing so many people with what we call long haulers, all of these complicated health issues that all the doctors they see, they throw their hands up and say, I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? So this is why doing something about this is so important. 
Now, there's a lot of things to do besides the vaccine, the vaccination. That's not the only answer, right? But I just want to make sure that you see this and understand these mechanisms, how this is driving this. Right. So when I mean, you talk about inflammation, right? this is not an immune course. This is to help you with the vaccine, give you information, help you with decision-making process and answer all of your questions, right? But I'm just telling you, like, you know, you look at certain things on a lab market, there's many things to look at, um, right? Which is, you know, if you're looking at somebody and you see that their antibody count, they have autoimmunity, you know, you think it's under control, but all of a sudden, you know, their antibody count for whatever the target tissue is elevates, right? That's a, that's, that's a, a green light. That's a, a sign that something's taken off. The immune system, the inflammatory response is taking off. And that means there could be more destruction. On a blood test, there's a marker called high ferritin or ferritin. Ferritin is a marker. If it's low, it represents low iron status, but high ferritin has got nothing to do with iron. High ferritin is a marker of, of, of inflammation. So these are markers that you want to run on a blood test routinely to see what state you're in. High CRP, many of you are familiar with this. You know, we run a new office, right? CRP, you know, C, it's called C reactive protein. Okay. All right. It is actually, many people don't know it, a lot of doctors don't know it. CRP is actually, it represents an immune chemical called interleukin-6 or IL-6. IL-6 is a nasty inflammatory immune chemical. It is the driver of autoimmunity. So if you see CRP, if you have autoimmunity and you see high CRP in your blood test, there's activation, right? So we know there's correlations when people have COVID, right? When they have COVID and they also have high CRP, okay, it's like 99% of the time we know that they are creating new autoimmune activation. On your blood test, you know, if we look at lymphocytes, which are part of your white blood cell, okay, okay, you start to see lymphocytes going down, okay? These are all like just lab markers. There's way more than I'm just giving you like, like you can look at lab tests, you can see markers, they can tell you the state of inflammation you're in, and really the goal is how to get inflammation down, right? So let's just say let the vaccination itself, right? What the vaccination? The vaccination does not prevent you from getting infected, right? It's not putting a, a shield dump around your body that the virus is just pinging off, right? right? What it's doing, right, it's allowing your body to produce the antibodies that recognizes the COVID-19 virus's spike proteins. That's the virus's weapon. So you're building up and creating these antibodies without getting the infection. So now there is, if you actually were to get infected, your immune system, there's no delay. Your body is flooded already with these antibodies. It's ready to go. Right? It is not going to prevent you from infecting others. So you can be get vaccinated, you can have immunity against it, right? But you can still get infected, you can still carry it, and you can still spread it to somebody else. Right? But it does decrease the severity of the infection, and that's pretty important. Because if you can decrease the severity of infection, then you're doing a really good job of preventing your existing autoimmunity from getting aggressively worse. And you're also preventing getting another or multiple autoimmunities and also increasing your risk of advancing cardiovascular disease and everything else. You're lowering your risk of those things. So part of really what we wanna do in the big scheme of things right, is, is the vaccine, as I'm painting a picture here, at least as it stands today, right? I'm just gonna tell you, this is my opinion now. This is not, <laughs> this is my opinion, okay? As it stands, okay, the vaccine, the vaccine seems to be the right thing to do, okay? 
I'm registered. When it's available, I plan on getting vaccinated. Okay. This is an opinion. My opinion. Right. This is unprecedented times. We hope spring, summer, next fall, whenever that we can get some semblance of getting back to normal life. That's what we want to do, right? We're not going to get back to normal life in any way, shape, or form if the majority of the population doesn't have immunity against this thing. Not going to happen. Because, again, without the immunity or short-term immunity is you are still susceptible to getting reinfected. And as the virus continues to mutate, which it's already doing, and it seems now that the new mutation is even more aggressive, <laughs> there's like no end in sight. And as I said there earlier, it is not going to be accomplished with herd immunity through getting the infection. Because of all the reasons I showed you before, because you're not going to develop long-term immunity. So it seems the only way out in the long run is the vaccination. And I think we all are going to have to do our part. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person should go out and get the vaccine. There are stipulations here, right? So, but besides the vaccine, what we also know is that if people, if, a, if you individually have a stronger innate immune system, if, you're in, if your innate immune system is robust, it allows the vaccine to work even that much better. Like they're saying like, wow, we're seeing through all the tests that people who had better innate immune system got so much better response from the vaccine than the people who had a really weak innate immune system. So it would stand to reason, right? Even now, you know, the vaccine isn't even available for the majority of people right now, that putting some attention to the innate system, what you can do to boost that innate immune system now and whether you get the virus or not or after the virus is critical so we cannot rely even though i'm saying the vaccine is a way out I can't, i'm saying to you that the vaccine is not the only answer here it is a multi-pronged approach right now there are a lot of things to do we can do things and take things a lot of people that i see in my office unfortunately when we run a blood test their white blood cell count is low we see their white blood cell counts well below five and the twos and the threes, and it's stuck there, right? That means you have a tired immune system. Right? If your immune system is being distracted elsewhere, if it's being distracted because it's got to fight food sensitivities that you got from foods that you're eating, if it's fighting other things going on in your body, it's just all kinds of stuff. It's just too tired to even face. It's not even paying attention to a virus, right? You got to get your knee innate and you got to get your adaptive immune system strong. So we got to support the innate and adaptive immune system. We do that certainly, of course, through lifestyle interventions and through diet and through nutraceuticals, right? You have to support the mucosal barrier. Now, some of you don't know me, but the mucosal barrier is your internal barrier. Your skin is your external barrier, right? So if you get a cut on your arm or someplace, you're going to clean and put a bandage over it. Why? So you don't get an infection in there. Right? And you take the bandage off, it's, if it's healed, you say, okay, good, I'm, I'm, no, no worries. Right? But the cells that make up your skin are very much like the cells on the inside of you. Right? And so your, the mucosal barrier on the inside of you, which is part of your sinuses and your bronchioles and your lungs and your entire GI tract, right? that barrier is protecting you from what's coming in from the environment. That includes the coronavirus. How does the coronavirus get inside you? Right, we're all you're wearing masks, so you know you don't want to get somebody's uh, particles floating into your eyes or your nose or your mouth, right? Carrying the virus, but the virus itself still has to pass through the mucosal barrier to get into your respiratory tract, to get into your lungs, right? 
And then those spike proteins that it's carrying locks onto those cells. And that's what allows them the virus to go inside your cell. But it's got to get through that mucosal barrier. So if your mucosal barriers are weak, stands to reason that you're going to get a higher volume, a higher load of viruses coming in, right? Putting at a disadvantage. If you have a much more robust, much more intact but mucosal barrier system, the viruses can't get through. Some may get through, but the volume is going to be a lot less, right? So really supporting the mucosal barrier system is really important. Also supporting, supporting your gut microbiome. Okay, again, this is like, you know, I say this all the time, but, you know, 80%, 70%, 80% of your immune system is in your gut, right? The, the bacteria, the organisms that are in your gut are regulating your immune system response. You want to have good, healthy microbiome. You want to have a good diversity of bacteria that are regulating your immune system response. So really what we want to be doing, and not just for this virus, for any other viruses, for the mutations of viruses, for everything, right, is immune resiliency, right? And these are the, you know, we got to support the innate and adaptive, support the mucosal barriers and support your gut, right? So again, these are the questions that we started with. So a quick review. Is it safe? Is the vaccine safe? Right? Co the consensus, the real, your answer is yes, it is safe. Okay. Now, there is a small caveat here, right? Maybe I'm not sure if the next slide does that, right? So, no. So, if a person, right? So, I'm talking to people in this, this webinar cast. Many of you are patients of mine, but there are also numbers of people here who are not patients of mine. So in light of that, I cannot be giving clinical advice, right? So I'm just telling you that, you know, is it safe? Well, again, it is safe for the vast majority of people, right? The question is, if a person though has, you know, uh, let's say a person has an underlying, you know, autoimmune problem. Now, it doesn't mean that a person who has an, an existing autoimmune condition should not get the vaccine. On the contrary, it would probably behoove them to get the vaccine so that they, if they get the virus, their problem doesn't get a heck of a lot worse and snowball into other stuff. But if a person was flared, if they have an underlying autoimmune problem and that autoimmune problem was in an active, aggressive, inflammatory state, then you would consider holding off from getting the vaccine until you got that inflammatory thing under control. Because, let me explain again, right? We said earlier that you get an immune, an immune response is in of itself, it's inflammatory. So the very nature of getting a vaccine, the very nature of getting this vaccine, right? Is to put the messenger RNA in, delivered by a fat molecule, no, no stuff in there, just saline. It gets in, the, the, the the messenger RNA sends its signal, then the enzymes destroy it. All that's good, okay? And then we start developing these spike proteins. Everything's good. And then you start getting the B cells made in those lymph nodes appropriately, and they start making antibodies, right? And they start att those antibodies attached to the spike proteins. And that's what you want, the bullseye to the spike protein. But the very nature of your immune system driving and creating these antibodies in and of itself creates an a inflammatory response mild but there's still an inflammatory response okay and it's usually kind of short-lived and then it would dissipate right? some people may get the vaccine some and they may not feel so good they may have got to feel tired and feel a little fluish and maybe get a little temperature change that's not bad. That's actually say, showing that your immune system responded. It actually is doing something. Your B cells are kicking the gear and making antibodies and it would really pass in a, you know, a couple of days. And that's exactly, you don't have to have that, but if you did, it's not bad. But if a person has an existing autoimmune and you're in a flared up state, you're already driving inflammation, you probably don't wanna push it further. And so that would be a reason for uh, holding off on the vaccine in that, in that response, right? or any other inflammatory, aggressive inflammatory state, okay? Again, is it giving me the virus? So you make clear, no, it's not giving you the virus. The Johnson Johnson vaccine apparently is, but this, the Pfizer, Moderna is not giving you the virus, it's giving you the RNA, giving you some instructions, 
What's in it? Again, we explain what's in it. It's just the, the RNA is carried by a fat molecule and, and it's in the vaccine with saline solution. There's no mercury, there's no metal, there's no junk in there. It's just saline and, a, and fat carrying the uh, messenger RNA to get it, so it gets it, it's getting it inside your cell. Remember, the RNA gets inside your cell, right? That's the new technology. The messenger RNA itself, this, 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 this vaccination concept has been around for over a decade, right? But the technology of using the nanoparticles called fat sci these fat cyber molecules to carry the RNA, to be able to get it inside your cell like this, that's what's new, okay? And it does not change your DNA, right? The, the RNA does not go inside your DNA. So there's no DNA changes there. There's no weird things happening to people. How will it affect my autoimmune disease? We just kind of beat that up, right? So we don't want the COVID because it will uh, make the COVID will make your autoimmune go on. But the vaccine, okay, is showing to mitigate autoimmune disease. The COVID, getting the COVID virus, getting the COVID disease is going to cause you to develop autoimmune disease or make you have more autoimmune diseases. We just talked about that. If survival rate is 99%, why should I get it? Well, again, that should be clear by now, right? Right. That concept is herd immunity. This concept is, right, is that if the survivor is 99%, right, then you're saying, well, then I'm okay. Get it. I'd rather get the, COVID, get the COVID infection than get the vaccine. Well, if you get the COVID infection, right, even though you survive, you're not dead. Right? there's a good likelihood that you're going to develop autoimmunity and maybe multiple autoimmunities. And you're not going to develop long-term immunity against it, which means you are prone to getting reinfected. And if we rely on the uh, herd immunity concept is that we are going to get more and more and more mutations, more and more variants. And then we're always going to be behind the eight ball and the variants have the possibility of getting even more aggressive. So that concept is not really, in my, again, in my opinion, a smart concept. Okay. And I just explained about that, just to go together. And what about the variant? So right now there is a variant, right? <laughs> and, and that's, could be a problem. Uh, all I can tell you is maybe at this point, what you're hearing, right? But um, as it stands right now, it seems to date that the, the antibodies that are being produced, right? The antibodies that are produced, which are again, against the spike protein, all right? That the variant, what's been shown so far that the variant, where the variant is taking place, okay, the variant is taking place with the spike protein. Let me go, I'm going to, I just, let me go back here. Okay, these slides, it should be a faster way to do this, but I apologize for skimming through these things. Let me, maybe a better way to do this here, right? Okay. Okay, first, first slide. Hey, there's the virus. These are the spike proteins. The variation is taking place with these guys, right? right. This, is what the, this is the weapon. This is what they use to get inside your cells, right? So it just kind of, so if we're trying to make antibodies against this and it's, a taking, and it's taking us a long time to make antibodies against these, these, you're giving the virus more and more time for these proteins to mutate. And then if we then by the time we make the antibodies, they got a new like pr protein and less effective. To date, it seems like the even with some variations to these spike proteins, uh, the uh, antibodies produced from the vaccine still recognize it because it's the vaccine's recognizing the entire the it's recognizing the entire pr spike protein. This might be a little too heady. The spike protein is a protein, right? So it's made up of a whole bunch of amino acids. And so what they're doing is they're only taking one little piece of that to make the messenger RNA. But 
the antibodies that are being produced for that are producing against the entire spike protein. So that's the benefit. So as long as we don't get too many variations, we're hopeful that the antibody count, if we can get it up, will be. But if, if the, and that's why this is, this is why it is pretty urgent that we get this, <laughs> the vaccine gets rolled out. This is why this has been a debacle, right? Because we're behind the eight ball because, right? Is that the faster people can start getting vaccinated, the more people that start getting vaccinated, the more people that start developing these antibodies, okay? The more the immune system is gonna neutralize these things and you're shutting this off and mutating. But the more that everything is delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, right? Is the more they're gonna get mutations. And then, yeah, then this vaccine is going to be not going to be doing much, and they got to do another vaccine, right? So, all right, let's go do some questions. Do you see a scenario in that game where there's multiple vaccinations, or is it just is it just the idea that, that it'll get weaker and weaker as the I, I well, it, 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 I should repeat that question. Say it again. So the pump. All right, let me, I see a couple of questions here. Okay, so I see one question here. I see that Robin's asking a question. If, okay, if you have had the virus and have the antibodies, do you need to vaccinate? Again, the answer would be yes. The answer, because if you've had the virus, right? What's been shown, is even though you're making the antibodies, you're making those antibodies not in the germinal center, you're making them outside of it, okay? And outside of it, it's been shown that they don't last very long. So, right, having the virus, okay, it, people are being shown to not have the antibody count to last very long. So that's not gonna give you long-term immunity. But the vaccine, Okay, the way they, the way the body, the way the immune system is making the antibodies in its more correct fashion, okay, is being shown to give at this point longer term immunity. Now, we still don't know really how long that is, right? Because it's like because we're into this like almost like you know, eleven months, right? We can't talk and say you know where we're going to be in five months, but you know, uh, research is very very hopeful, right? Uh, what else do we have here? Let me see if I understand the questions here. Uh, how do we get to herd immunity if the vaccine does not prevent you from getting infected? It's not about not getting infected. We get infected with stuff all the time, Bill. In other words, you were, we're, we're exposed. Hmm? Yeah, okay. We're exposed. We're exposed to viruses all the time. We live with vi thousands of viruses in us. All right, there are viruses in the air. You don't realize you're breathing in viruses constantly, right? And your immune system is creating response against that. That's what we want, right? Um, so, so the the herd immunity is that you're getting the appropriate antibody response so that you're lessening people from dying, you're lessening the severity of it, right? And you move through it with very little consequences. Right? You know, you get infected, you get a cold, you get something, it's like no big deal. People run around with colds, right? You know, no, no big deal. You go keep, the world is not shutting down because people get colds. Right? Colds, uh, cold. Uh, someone is saying, yeah, I heard the vaccine is only effective for 120 days, plus they're coming up with another new vaccine to be given in addition, the current one to respond to at least one variant. Uh, if it's short term, an additional vaccine is necessary. But I don't know what, I don't know where you're getting that information. I don't know what, where you're getting that from. I don't know what the resources, okay? I mean, I'm trying to, I'm telling you what I'm telling you is from, I didn't put the citations up here, okay? But 
these this is research coming from scientists and these are being published in nature immunology you cannot get any higher than nature immunology okay you can't put any inf you can't put any articles into nature immunology without <laughs> It being like, it's the thing. So, I mean, this information now, so I don't know what you're hearing about, you know, it's only effective for 120 days. Um, you know, I'm, you know, as far as new vaccines go, I don't know, there is variation. So, you know, time will tell. But the problem is that not enough people have immunity. That's the problem, right? So the faster and the more the, the, you know, we can get people vaccinated, you know, I know this is like, you wouldn't believe that you're hearing this from me, right? I, and I know that you people, would, people, patients are like, I can't believe that Dr. Pucci is saying that he's going to get the vaccination. He's talking positively about the vaccination, right? But that is exactly the reason why I'm sitting here on a Thursday night doing this for you. Because it is that important that you hear this information, right? right? And get some clarity on this, right? So you can make an educated decision for yourself. Right. This is coming from prestigious, from scientists that are, I mean, that are doing this stuff. This is not coming from hearsay. Okay. Now there's still a lot of stuff that's unknown, right? It's still, we're still in the infancy. So we can't, I can't say to you, if you get the vaccination that you're going to have immunity five, six, eight years, 10 years now, I don't know. I, how can I possibly say that? Nobody can possibly say that. Okay. But they do see, right, at this point, how it's working. And it does look a lot favorable. And again, you go back to the slide about risk. And if you say, you know, what's the risk if I get the vaccination versus what's the risk if I don't get the vaccination? What's the risk if I get the infection? And now that I have a variant and then that this new variant is even more aggressive, what happens if I get that infection? And what happens if I get the COVID vaccine? What, vaccine? what happens if I get the, the COVID infection when simultaneously I have something else going on in my body that's flaring up. The risk of being infected, okay, really kind of outweighs the vaccination for the majority of people, for the majority of people, right? Now, again, there are going to be more questions, right? So some of the questions are, and I don't hear this talked about on the news a lot, right? When they talk about, um, the prioritization, who should get the vaccines first and second, all those kinds of different things, right? Um, you know, doctors and such, right? People on the front lines, absolutely, right? Um, you know, so they do talk about elderly people, right? Now, again, this, now I'm, I'm trying to clarify my opinion. Okay, so this is not from any scientific journal that I read. This is my opinion, right? But elderly people, their immune systems are not as robust. Elderly people, their immune systems don't respond as much. So if you're giving them the vaccination, are you going to actually get the same response that you want? You no, know, it's kind of like I don't know. You know, I'm not saying the immune, and I'm not saying the vaccine is going to cause a problem. I'm just saying that maybe giving them the vaccine is not going to cause that that robust antibody response the way that it would in somebody who would be younger. So I think these are some things that scientists will continue to look into a little bit. Okay, let's see, uh, do I have any questions? Uh, any questions, anybody? Just, you know, I'll stay as long as you want. Um, are you finding this helpful? Yes. Right? I don't see a lot of faces. I just see a lot of. Uh... Yeah, there's a number of people. You know, they feel a lot more comfortable about the vaccine. This is clarifying. Um, so Let me get down here. Um, whoop, sorry to make you guys dizzy. There's one more slide. Um, so we re we emphasize besides the vaccine right, besides the vaccine, right, is, and even more, like if you talk about, I just said, if you talked about people that are older and maybe their immune systems are not as responsive, it would behoove them, 
to be putting a lot of energy here in immune resiliency. It would behoove them, right? To support the innate and adaptive immune system through diet, through lifestyle interventions, through stress management, through the specific, you know, uh, immune supports. Uh, really, really important. There are really a lot of good botanicals that are important, right? Uh, you know, you hear a lot about, thankfully, hear about vitamin D as an example and zinc and these things. I'm glad, glad it's coming to fruition in the uh, populist world with medical doctors, right? But uh, uh, a lot of things take a long time to catch up, right? You know, the, the, the vitamin D role is what it does is it helps your adaptive immune system be balanced. That's pretty cool. That's pretty important, actually, right? Because even your adaptive immune system could get pretty dysregulated. Okay, so having adequate these. So again, a little sidebar, right? So uh, if you're going to get the if you're going to get the vaccine at some point, right? Um, knowing some markers would really be important. Like for example, knowing your vitamin D levels would be really an important thing to know uh, before you got the vaccine. Why? Because your the vitamin D levels regulates that immune system response, that adaptive response, your T cells and B cells, right? So the vaccine is going to, if you can see my hand, I don't know, is going to stimulate the B cell response, which is appropriate, right? But you don't want it to kind of get like too much because that's going to create an inflammatory response. Your vitamin D regulates that. So getting your vitamin D levels like above 50 would be a good idea, right? Uh, and again, we want to support the mucosal barriers and support the gut microbiome. So that said, anybody who's looking to maybe go the next step. So if you're just looking to saying what immune support should I have, what kind of you know supplements or nutritional support should I have that is geared towards immune system support, right? You can uh, we you know package some things that we use in our office that I use. Um, there's a dispensary, online dispensary is called CareWell. Um, that way you can go online and just go direct to CareWell and you can order our bundles right there and they'll be delivered right to you. It's really e easy. Uh, for access to that, um, you're just gonna fill out the metabolic form and send it to us, right? So Cynthia, that metabolic form is where? So Cynthia posted in the chat. So if you want to have access to that, that's a really cool way. You don't have to even come into our office or anything to get supplements. You can just go to CareWell and just order these bundles. Okay, just on a, another quick sidebar. You know, when you're looking at the vaccination aside, right? But just for overall immune system response and strategies with the infection, right? There are really like kind of like four stages clinically of working with people, right? So the First stage is 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 one is would be maybe that's five stages. One is prevention. Right? We want to increase and have a robust, uh, resilient immune system to prevent infection or at least mitigate the severity of it. Right. The second phase is if you were infected, right, is you want to uh, control that from getting out of hand. You want to keep it under control so that you don't get an exaggerated inflammatory response. Okay. Uh, the second, you know, kind of phase is that when you're in the act of infection, when there is inflammation, right, is you have different strategies. I have different strategies for you, right, uh, to regulate that inflammatory response. And then there is also strategies clinically when you are recovering. So they, you know, there are some parts that, you know, you do the whole time, but there are parts that are different for different stages of, of immune support through not just COVID infection, but any kind of infection, basically, but, but, you know, COVID. So anyway, anyone who is interested, you know, we did a five day, you know, kind of health, uh, five pound challenge and health and wellness challenge for five days, which was, you know, very, very you know, successful, um, worked out really well. And so we're looking to do more of those. So for, if you want to go into a little bit more of a more of an immersive two or three day immune boost challenge, just type the word in yes into the chat. Uh, if there is enough people that are interested in this, uh, we'll look at it and we'll put it together for you, okay? Uh, it's for you. So if you're interested, we will do that for you. And uh, if you want to, if anybody wants to go deeper with me specifically, uh, you can just schedule a discovery call with me. Um, uh, there's no charge for that. It's complimentary. It's about 20 minutes. Uh, it's just to see where you're at. 
uh, and see if what I do can give you a little bit of insight and if what we do is a good fit for you. Uh, so if you want to do that, you can make a discovery call. Yeah, so immune bundles are available, an immune boost challenge, if you want to do that two, three days, maybe four days, uh, whatever we need to do. Uh, and you can call me for a discovery call, right? And you can go to getwell-now.com. That's the website. And just click on discovery call and you have access to me. Any other questions, please, anybody? Um, hmm? There's some questions coming in? If you had a past reaction to a vaccination, okay? Um, depending on what kind of reaction that you had, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Um, you know, again, you know, when they talk about these vaccines, you know, they are talking about, you know, 95%. You got to realize that there's no nothing out there that's 100%. It just isn't, right? Uh, so you got to still think about the, um, just admit, you got to think about the big, 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 big picture. Okay. Um, so listen, I apologize. I just see that somebody just was admitted. I know it's, we're near the, actually near the end of this webinar, but this webinar is recorded, right? So how can people rewatch them? All right, well, the, <laughs> The webinar is recorded. So anyone who wants to get access and wants us to get it to them and rewatch it or share it with somebody, please do. We'll just reach out to us and we'll get the recording to you. Um, let's see what else we have. This. Okay. All right, everyone. All right. Good night, everybody. I think we've covered everything. If anyone has any other questions that come up, just you know, contact us, contact Cynthia, and we will get answers to you. We're, I'm here, we're here for you. We're all in this together. It's very, very true, right? And we're learning every day. Uh, this is challenging times, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Uh, so be well, stay well, take care of yourselves, and uh, I'll see you all soon. All right, best to everybody.